All right, I'm here with Simon, the founder of Podseeker, who recently got acquired for six figures. Simon, how are you doing today? Really good, Andre. Great to be with you. Yeah, thanks for coming on. So for those that may not know you, do you want to give a brief introduction of yourself? Yeah, sure. So I grew up in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, I'd say I got my start in my career uh, at a place called MI9, which was a a joint venture between Microsoft and a a broadcast network in Australia called Channel 9, working mainly in sort of customer success. That was a great job and I was onto a good thing there and I really liked it there, but I kind of got the the entrepreneurial bug. So left a a steady job with a good path to move overseas and go start a business, not not this business, not Podseeker. But while I was running that business, one of the main ways that I would generate leads for that business was to reach out to podcasts that had a relevant audience I wanted to reach and you know pitch myself as a guest. And, and that worked out to be really well. But I did notice at the time it was a really clunky like discovery process to find, you know, who are the good podcasts, like who actually has, you know, a decent audience size that would, you know, yield good results. So that's when I kind of got the the first idea for Podseeker. But it wasn't until, you know, a few years later that I came to realize after working with this company called Meltwater that PR people have a really good toolkit for traditional media journalist outreach. So if you need to reach out to CNN or the New York Times and need to know, you know, who writes about tech or health at those publications. They have a really good toolkit for that. But, you know, given podcasts are like a new media format, there wasn't a really good toolkit for for that same kind of process. And so that's where the idea for Podseeker was born. And that's when I put together our first product, which um, we can get into, which was pretty janky. And it's just kind of, you know, grown from there. Yeah, you answered, uh, you answered probably like five of my questions I was going to ask. So thank thank, <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, let's let's dive into to Pod Podseeker and uh, congrats on you know making the jump in entrepreneurship. Just you know from a high level, what is you you briefly touched on it, but to my understanding, you know in PR you have press release sites, you have big databases of different reporters, lots of manual outreach and stuff. What did, and you had some parallels to that, but for podcasts, what did Podseeker? What problem did it essentially solve? So like I said, yeah, if, if you're a PR person, like you have really good toolkits for those traditional media formats and they're using them every day, which is something, you know, I came to learn. And then I had just always been, you know, into podcasts like a, as a listener. But like I said, I also kind of, you know, reached out and pitched to to some of those podcasts as well. So, you know, when I married those two data points together, like one, you know, I found it a difficult process. And then two, you know, noticing that PR people were solving the problem in this other domain yet didn't have a way to solve it in in the podcast domain um that's when i realized you know that there, there could be something there so the problem it solves is just allows you to scale podcast outreach so if you want to reach out to podcast to pitch yourself as a guest or for an advertising opportunity uh, or for a partnership opportunity and you want to know that you're reaching out to the right podcast and you want to know how to get in contact with them like you know what's the best email to to email them on um podseeker lets you do that you know far more quickly than than you could if you were just doing that manually interesting i what i love about that i love how you took an existing business model for a more traditional market press pr newspapers blogs whatever and then applied it towards uh, a newer medium being podcasts which i think really de-risk kind of the idea or the concept of the business because you can look over on the right hand side and say hey there's this other big market but there's this new medium is emerging there should be a similar version for that i love that yeah 100 percent. and i think the thing that kind of made me go okay all right like make the decision to to actually build something was i was kind of looking for some validation that you know there was in fact that crossover into the podcast space and there was a gap there and i was i was looking through g2 crowd at at some of the reviews for some of these traditional media databases and i came across one in particular that said um you know this is a great database it's a great product to get a lot out of it but I'm paraphrasing here, but it was something along the lines of um, like, I'd give my left arm and my right leg and like, you know, I'd shave my eyebrow or something like oh. that. If it, if it would just include podcasts in the database, so I was like, Hey, that's uh that's probably a signal. So yeah, I uh, worked with a developer and like I said, built a, a very, very janky V1, but you know, despite it being so janky and and so terrible to look at like people still wanted to use it and so that that was you know further validation that it 
there was something there that I could you know actually build on. That's awesome. Reading customer reviews is such an underrated way to like figure out customer pain points, validate businesses. Like it's a really simple way to do it. You basically go to a review site, go to a category, look at what everybody's complaining about, and then you can mm-hmm. find a lot of opportunities or you'll have some ideas that might pop up in your head. Um, yeah. So ni- nice job there. Now my next question is, um, how'd you get your first customer? How did, <laughs> how did you, how did you get that, that first, first customer to pay you? Yeah. So the, I mean, the first thing I tried to do was track down that person who said they'd, you know, give down their, give their, their right arm. For, for <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know if you'd want that as a payment, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, the, uh, the first thing I did was like, um, just, just cold emailed a few PR agencies and said, you know, Hey, are you using a media database? And, you know, do you also want to use that database to, to reach out to podcasts? You know, I've noticed that that's not possible. Would you like to use this database? And that just like, you know, people often will say, you know, cold email outreach is kind of like pointless unless your your average contract value is like, you know, under uh, over $5,000 and things like that. But I found like for, even for this $50 a month product, like the conversion rate on people responding to that email was so high that that ended up being like a, a really solid channel. So that that's definitely how I got uh, the first customers. And, and that's how I ended up getting a lot more customers was just kind of, you know, one-to-one emailing PR agencies and being like, Hey, do you want this? And it just resonated so strongly that, um, it didn't feel like I was, you know, churning out this numbers game to, to do it because it was just, like, everyone just resonated so well with it. Yeah. That's, that's definitely when, you know, you have product market fit, when you're able to take a really simple go to market strategy or channel or whatever you want to call it, cold email is kind of at the bottom, you know, your response mm-hmm. rates are going to be the lowest. It's the busiest, it's the noisiest, yeah. uh, but if you're able to have a pitch so compelling that people actually respond to it and then pay, that's interesting. So that's when, you know, I, I would say, yeah, I think you have product market fit. I guess my next question would be, was there like a specific moment that you had where you felt like, okay, I really have product, like I really have something like this is like that kind of like that rush feel where you're like, cause you build the product, you do the research. You get maybe one or two customers, but was there like a specific moment where you thought, you know, this thing could really go much farther than, you know, just a few customers? Yeah, I I think there were kind of like a, a bunch of those along the way. Like if, if I go back and, and look at the revenue graph, like it wasn't like this. I mean, it, it trended up over time, but it was it wasn't like a smooth line. It was more like across, 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 and then big step up, across, 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 big step up. And for reasons I can't really explain, so I, I don't really know like why that is. But certainly, like every time one of those jumps happened and then it you know maintained itself, those were all you know very very great validation moments. But I suppose you know like you know, hitting the first thousand MRR that, that was really nice. And then it's like, okay, well, I'm definitely onto something here. I think it was around about a thousand bucks MRR because like I said, I I created this very janky V1, which was essentially like an API wrapper around another service, which didn't have a nice UI. And I just kind of put a nice UI on top of it. And that was when I was like, okay, onto something here, let's actually, you know, build our own backend and our own database for this and, and, and start to scale it up. Very nice. So things are things are going good. You have an interesting business. It's solving a clear market need. Um, when did you make the decision to to sell it? Can you walk me through maybe your thought process on that? Why did why did you go and look for an acquisition? Yeah. So so funnily enough, it was probably about a year ago. And th- and this is where I can get into you know some of the not necessarily downsides, but like there was a point in time where I realized it like. It was. It might have been a difficult product to grow in the form that it was in. Like things needed to change about the product in order to like go into different markets. That that's what my thoughts were at the time. And so it was kind of like a bit of a fork in the road. Like okay, I need to double down on this. And the other thing I should add, like this is pretty much a side project. You know, the, the whole time I'm working on it. So I'm not you know like twelve hours a day on it kind of thing. It's like you know the few hours that I can kind of get to put into it. And yeah, it it just sort of came to me that it was, you know, it was going to require essentially a full-time effort um, in order to make it like a really big business or so, so I thought. 
And then one day this guy reached out to me, his, his name is Ben, he's, he's a great guy. And we just kind of got talking about, you know, him taking over the business with me being, you know, somewhat involved as like a, a minority shareholder. So he was going to buy out most of the business and I was going to, you know, essentially kind of consult with him. And that ultimately the deal didn't go through for, for a number of reasons, which we can get into, but it did sort of get me in the mindset of, okay, I, th- I think this is the decision that I want to make is to... um is to to sell the business for, for a number of reasons but and then nice. you know to to actually get to the the acquisition that, that just went through you know i tip my hat to you i just essentially put it up on acquire.com well, hey, 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 okay, okay okay i'll stop, I'll stop. Let's slow down <laughs> on the details here i got i got some questions but that's typically you know we see that a lot where a startup will have someone reach out and that's when we'll see a lot of startups work with us or at least on our marketplace to find more buyers. Because there's a saying, if you have one buyer, you have no buyers. So you have no leverage. And so if that one falls through, you know, you have no other buyer to, you know, create leverage with, raise the valuation, whatever it may be. But what made you decide to um, list on acquire.com? How'd you find it? Yeah. So Not I there. have... Yeah, I've always been um, involved in like the the microconf community, like Rob Wallings community. If you're, you're familiar with that, yeah, um, I love Rob. Yeah, so yeah, and people people talk about it all the time there. That's that's where most of these kind of you know like micro entrepreneurs, like uh, indie hackers, you know, indie SaaS builders, whatever you want to call them, they tend to just say you know if you're selling your business, acquire.com is is the one to go to. So that's like the f- the first and only place that that I went to, and and that's where I heard about it. And yeah, I've had yeah, like I said, I tip my hat to you. Like I've, how, I've had how, a really how good experience through it. I mean that's a that's a fabulous compliment. Um, I appreciate that. How's how's my group conf as a conference? I've always wanted to go. So I've never actually been to the conference. I'm I'm just in the the Slack community, um, which is really great, and I can highly recommend. I, I definitely want to go to the conference, but I'm in Australia. They're always in the US, so it's um it's just a it's a bit of a heavier lift for me to get there. But I'd love yeah, to go one day. That makes sense. Yeah, you're like I don't know, three four thousand miles away. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, that's like 15 at, hours. It's yeah, a long way. <laughs> I'm not good at math, but but for anyone who um is thinking about growing a micro SaaS business, Rob Walling has some really really good content on YouTube. Highly recommend checking that out. So shameless plug. Shout out to Rob. But moving towards back to the acquisition story. So mm-hmm. you list on Acquire.com. You go live with your listing. What happens in the first week? Tell me about. How many buyers reached out? What were your expectations? How were you feeling? Like, how'd it go? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it definitely exceeded my expectations. Like, I'd have to go back and look at the numbers. But, like, I, I feel like within the first week or two, I, there were, like, at least, I don't know, like, 10 people who reached out with, you know, who were, who were genuinely interested. And, like, you know, on your platform, it, it tells you, like, they've got the funds. And, like, we verified that they've got the funds. So, you know, they're all, like, you know, the the not like kite tire kickers there. I will say at first, like when I listed the business, I wasn't like desperate to sell it. Like I didn't, you know, like need to to get out anytime soon. So I did list it at a, a much higher price than what it was worth, quote unquote, just because I was like, well, like, you know, let's see if there's any bites at that level and and I can always come down. So that was that was largely like the response that that I got, which I I, you know, completely expected was Hey, really like the, your business. I'm I'm definitely interested, but but not at that price point. Would you consider coming down? And f- for the longest time, I was just like, Nah, I'm I'm not really interested in coming down. And so so it actually sat there for probably like six months, but like you know, just with with people you know putting in lower offers than than what I wanted, but like real offers until I you know like came to reality and, and said okay, okay like the, the market has determined that the price is actually you know at this sort of reasonable rate and not this kind of like highball figure that that I had in mind yeah you want to know um a quick little like tip on how to actually get like the highest multiple typically from what I've seen I would, I would love to yeah it's counterintuitive but it's it's priced low you price lower oh, okay than, you want to know why I more buyers as as I it, as I it, use exactly. It. So the name of the mm. game, you're selling the business. So the more buyers mm. you can bring to the table, the more conversations you have, the more interested buyers you get to 
you know, solicit an offer to you, a letter of intent. That gives you the opportunity to negotiate upwards on valuation, terms, all that fun stuff. So a small tip there is definitely, you know, when you when you list, if you price too high on your on acquire.com, we also have this interesting feature. I'm not sure if you knew about it, but if you reduce your price by 10% or more, all buyers will be notified as well. So if you're priced high, you can always come down later. But that's why we recommend pricing within normal market valuations, because then mm. you at least get just a conversation with a buyer. You at least get to meet with yeah. them and have, you know, kind of sell, you know, the growth opportunity or the great parts about your business and have that dialogue with the buyer that may eventually acquire you. But moving on to um, how you find your found your buyer, I'd love to to know about that. How did how did you figure out through all the buyers that sent offers, that signed NDAs? How did you land on the the individual that eventually acquired the business? Yeah, so so for starters, like we we just got along, so we had a call. Like he, he was a really good guy, and I think importantly, he he just like he really knew what he was doing, and he kind of like laid out like he had acquired a business before and he just really like laid out the steps and he just he he made me feel like if we were to go through with this that it would be as painless as it as it could possibly be and like i've heard enough uh, you know i've heard enough acquisition stories that have been wildly stressful and overly complicated to to not have want to wanted to go through that like we were, we were yeah. talking before offline like i've got you know i've got two young boys and like i didn't want to essentially give myself, you know, another job in, in just going through the acquisition. And so that was definitely a big part of it. And also like, you know, what, while he didn't, you know, go for my like highball price at the start, like, you know, it was, it was a price that I was happy with and and that he was happy with, you know, he sees a lot, a lot of really great potential in the business and it just feels like it's, it's going to a really good home. So yeah, those are the main nice. reasons. That, that, that is so, so, so important in terms of, there's another great quote, you can't do a good deal with a bad person. So you and the buyer, <laughs> you you have to, you just have to get along. I've seen so many deals, acquisitions just fall through because someone's not responsive or someone is, you know, like you're just not on the same page in terms of what you're trying to accomplish. And then specifically, you don't have a clear plan. So mm. one maybe tip for others listening is, before you sign an LOI, one thing I always recommend is having like a pre LOI signing call where you, mm. it sounds like you did this really well. So Simon, you had like a plan in place. What are we going to do when we go into due diligence? Just knowing that upfront can tell you so much about the buyer. Like yeah. do they, cause you don't want to sign an LOI and then this person is kind of figuring it out and that's, and then that yeah. letter of intent falls yeah. through. Then you got to go back to the buyers and say like, this buyer yeah. you want to and you gotta have a story exactly um, yeah and we, we yeah we we did like a a version of that and the, the other thing was which and this was like a big one was like i said there was like i had sort of gone through like maybe a bit of an acquisition process about a, a year earlier and one of the things i'd come to notice is like especially when you're transferring a stripe account from one country to another if you're transferring it within country it's relatively straightforward but from one country to another is wildly complicated and you need to make like a lot of code changes and it's it's a really it's it's a really heavy lift and, and quite annoying and he had done that previously in his uh in his previous business and so like he he called that out specifically which was like one of my like major concerns i was like that's going to be an absolute i don't know if i can swear on the show but like an, an actual like shit show and it turned out to be uh still somewhat painful but like as painless as it could possibly be so that was really good yeah I think I think the biggest lesson like or the takeaway is, you know, the person you sell to, you know, a lot of founders just focus just on valuation and like just on terms, but you forget that, you know, those aren't real unless you actually close acquisition. And so to close acquisition, you want to go with someone who's, you know, experienced again on the same page as you. You get along, there's some sort of plan post LOI. They're able to point out maybe things that are going to be an issue. That's always a huge like, okay, great. Like you have this understood because if you went with, you know, a buyer where less technical, they wouldn't understand how to deal with that situation. The deal would fall through potentially. Yeah, so, totally. So hats off to you for um, due diligence, due diligence the buyer because it's a, it truly is a two way street. Um, yeah, I guess, for sure. I guess another question is um, how'd you prepare for the acquisition? Did you um, create like any docs or materials or 
Yeah, uh, <laughs> not as many as as would have been um, ideal. I mean, we we had all the docs that that we kind of needed to do. L- luckily, the the product itself is relatively straightforward. So, like you know, the buyer getting to know the product was was fairly straightforward. It's like a it's like advanced search for podcasts. So, so that side of it was fine. And then the code, like I, I'm. I can write a little bit of code, but I'm I'm no means a, a software engineer, so I wasn't totally across that side of things as well. But but the buyer was, and so I just you know essentially gave him access to to GitHub, and and he just kind of combed through that and and uh, had a look through it all. So that all went well. But in terms of like processes and things like that, there just wasn't a lot of that because of essentially pretty much just me for for the duration of the business. There's a fairly like passive business like i said i i had a, a a job like most of the time i was i was doing this business and actually th- this is something i didn't touch on earlier as as one of the main reasons that i d- decided to sell the business was it was really passive for me and i just kept hearing from like you know people i was talking to like passive income does not exist and like if it does exist like you you better bet that it's it's temporary because you know one of these like external services that you rely on like some api they're going to shut down or like something's going to happen over here and like it's going to require you to to really dive in and and put a lot more effort into it than than you're currently putting into it um and so that was kind of always in the in the back of my mind was um okay you know something's going to shut off here and so i just need to be uh kind of mindful of that yeah. Yeah. That that's super common. You know, a lot of a lot of successful acquisitions are just timing, you know, where mm-hmm. you sell it at the right time for the right reasons, because you never know what's gonna happen in the future. Like AI just came out or open AI just came out with something where it can like read PDFs. When I sold my previous business, it was a drag and drop mobile app builder. Within a month, Amazon released a free version of what I had built. So yeah, it just, wow. you know, I, you know, I always joke like with software companies, you're not going to hand them down to your children just because it's going to be disrupted like 20 times by then. So if you're not able to continue, like continue with product development, keeping up with customers, you know, you're, you know, over time, competition is just going to creep in and eventually surpass you, in my opinion. Um, yeah. So kudos to you on, um, you know, realizing, you know, if you don't have the, the time and effort, it it's probably a good time to sell it rather than just letting it slowly die off. Yeah, totally. And yeah, like I said, you know, I just, I really got the sense from the buyer that it was going to a good home. Like he, he had big plans for it. He had the skill set, you know, that, that was required to take it to the next level. And so, you know, I'm, I'm super excited to see what he's going to do with it. Yeah. I'm watching closely for sure. I mean, it sounds like it sounds like a real, real problem and also a growing market. So that's a great acquisition. Um, yeah. In terms of, um, we touched on due diligence, asset transfers. I, I guess maybe for, you know, final questions, you know, you've been through an acquisition. Congrats again on the close. You found a great buyer. You built a great product. If you had just like three pieces of advice for other startup founders that might be looking to sell their businesses, what what are the top three learnings that you would tell them? Yeah, so... so- one of them is is that thing that we were talking about is um like I, I'm really happy with how this acquisition went through and while whilst I haven't been through a nightmare acquisition like I, I know they definitely exist and like I'm really glad that I didn't have to go through that and so it's a you know that that's potentially like if you you know you had two buyers and everything else is equal uh, apart from you know one's offering you less money but you know it's going to be a smoother acquisition and one's offering you more money but it might be you know a bit more hellish then you know i would go with the the former in in that situation i love that advice yeah. i love that advice i tell that to founders sorry to interrupt but i, I tell that to yeah. founders all the time you know it's not yeah. always the highest price you know you want to mm-hmm. go with someone where you have the highest probability of close like that's kind yeah. of where i i especially if you have you know a reputable buyer whether it's a private equity firm and they they come in a little bit lower than maybe an individual you're not too sure about Go for the person that has a higher chance of close, higher probability of close, more expertise, because it'll save you a ton of headaches. Because having an LOI not go through is is fairly painful and common. Yeah, yeah, and, totally. and, and avoidable too. Yeah, yeah. The um the the other one is I I don't know if this is necessarily advice that I would give to others, but I know like for for my 
next business when whenever that may be. Like one thing about Podseeker is it was a great business and it always brought on new customers, but it was a really high churn business. Like the the problem it it solves a real problem, but it's it's not necessarily a recurring problem for a lot of people. So like if you want to run a podcast outreach campaign, you kind of do the campaign and then you don't really need the tool anymore. And so we solved that problem a little bit by offering it to agencies because they would have multiple clients who had multiple campaigns, but you still have this kind of like seasonality mm-hmm. component of that. And so there, there was a lot of churn, like, if, you know, it was yeah higher than average churn to the degree that I know what the benchmarks are in that space. So for, for my next business, I think I would go, and I guess the flip side of that coin is like, it was a really easy product to onboard. So it was really easy to acquire a customer and get a customer using it, but they would churn out very easily as well. And that's like, you know, there's definitely a case to be made that that's a really good balance of, of how you want those those metrics to look. I think personally for my next business, I'd probably just prefer to, you know, it'd be a little harder to acquire the customer, a little harder to onboard the customer, but but know that, you know, they're they're rock solid and and really kind of, you know, ingrained in the product in a way that they won't churn as as much as they did with Podseeker. That that would be the other one that comes to mind. That's two. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, yeah. <laughs> Damn it. I'm all need to it, Simon. <laughs> yeah, cool. I I think I would yeah, like I said, this was a side project and I I don't know if I would do another side project again. I think like the next time that I start a business and like I have run businesses full time before, there's obviously trade offs to that. Like you don't have like a solid secure income. Um, I know some people would you know argue that a job's not that secure either, but it's it's probably a little bit more secure than than entrepreneurship. But if I were going to go down the entrepreneurship path, I'd I'd make sure that all my ducks were in a row so that I could go full time on it and, you know, have a nice runway and just really like put everything I had into it. Yeah, that would be my next one. For for me personally, like and then that's definitely not uh, applicable to everyone, but th- that's what I would do. You you would be surprised at how many entrepreneurs, as soon as they sell a business, I talk to so many. It's like, what are you doing next? Yeah. It's like, oh, I already got this like new business I'm working on and I'm yeah. going bigger this time because you have more confidence, you have more experience and typically you have a little bit of seed capital. So it can yeah. be a launch pad into you know, something bigger and better. Like I, I've started a new day job. I'm really happy in the day job. I'm really liking the role, really like the people. So that's definitely like where my focus is at the moment. There's this other thing that has just come up like through a conversation with, you know, someone else and when we're kind of you know talking about ideas and and seeing what could happen on that front but i'll um i'll keep a bit hush uh on that for the for the time being i love it you seem you seem excited about it that's always the funnest part is i mean there's so many fun parts about a startup but like the ideation stage and you're like kind of like which we call it like you know yeah, like customer yeah. research um, yeah totally and then you have the first customer oh man i love the whole journey i'll end with this but um yeah, you know, like I, I, have, I have two boys under two. You know, I kind of want to, you know, make sure like I'm, I'm really putting as much focus as I possibly can there. And, um, you know, entrepreneurship, as, as you well know, it, can, it can take a lot out of you. And so, you know, when I do make that leap, but it, it might be in a few years from now, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of have my ducks in a row, I suppose, so, so I can do that. So I'm looking forward to that day. But yeah, it won't, won't be any time in the, the near future. I don't think. Right on. Well. Sam, I'm, I'm rooting for you either way. And uh, huge congrats again on the acquisition. That's a huge feat. And um, if people want to learn more about your story, um, where can they find you online? Uh, I do have a website that I don't put much on, but it's simonthompson.co. We'll put that um, in the show notes. But who who has the .com? Who has simonthompson.com? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's some like triathlete. There's also a I don't know, like the CEO of Rio Tinto or some multinational conglomerate. Like his name's Simon Thompson as well. So oh, he man. got that one. Well, but you'll yeah. get you'll get there one day and you'll buy that SimonThompson.com. <laughs> yeah, totally. I think so. All right, Tom. Well, thanks so much for sharing your story and coming on the podcast. And again, I'm rooting for you, man. Yeah, awesome. Thanks a lot for having me, Andrew. Great to meet you. And and like I said, kudos to what you built with acquire.com. It was, you know, great product and great experience to go through. So thank you. I appreciate that. All right, cheers, man. Cheers.